don't think that Beverly was involved in this? She did it. Take the car right at Mr. Stubbins and mowed him down. <laughs> Shut up, Scotty. <laughs> Kathleen Turner seems oh, like the all-American homemaker, but she's really on a murderous tear, killing all of the boars in her neighborhood in the comedy <laughs> Serial Mom. One of five new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert, including new pictures with Chevy Chase, an Alaskan Husky, and a story about the early years of the Beatles. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie is Serial Mom, directed by John Waters, who in movies like Polyester and Hairspray has specialized in ripping the lid off of suburbia and revealing the decadence beneath. He does the same thing this time in the story of a suburban mom played here by Kathleen Turner, who seems to be the soul of sanity, but is in fact a raging psychopath. The slightest suggestion is enough to trigger one of her murderous rages. It takes 90 to 100 years for a tin can to decompose, and she still won't recycle. Cost the taxpayers millions of dollars last year, but she don't care nothing about the national budget. I hate Mrs. Ackerman. I hate her too. I hate her guts. You know, somebody ought to kill her. Yeah. Give her a happy face. And then recycle her. For the sake of this planet, somebody just might. Mom seems so normal, however, that even after suspicion starts to grow, her family can't believe it. Her daughter is played here by talk show hostess Ricky Lake, whose first starring role was six years ago in John Waters' Hairspray. God, you'll never get a boyfriend. When the serial mom goes on trial, she makes a good initial impression on the jury, but then she begins to seem increasingly odd. Juror number eight here is played by Patricia Hurst. I've known this Sutton family for 16 years. Dad, Eugene, he's my dentist. Chip and Misty played with my own children. But I found out that I don't know Beverly Sutton at all. No one really knows Beverly Sutton. You see... Beverly Sutton is insane. The idea behind Serial Mom is a promising one, I guess, with criminals becoming celebrities on television, but somehow the movie never really gets off the ground. One of the problems, I think, is that the Kathleen Turner character is so crazy that she's not really funny. Turner is a good actress, and somehow she manages to bring too much reality to the role until we start sympathizing with this out-of-control woman who really doesn't understand what she's doing. The result is a movie where a lot of the miscellaneous stuff in the background and the corners of the movie is very funny, but the central situation somehow seems more sad than anything else. I think that's where the problem is, right at the center of the picture. John Waters used to make some very edgy, dark comedies with a 300-pound transvestite named Divine in yeah. the center of his pictures. Well, now he's got a star who's in on the joke. Mm -hmm. See, that's the problem. The Kathleen Turner, we know, knows that this is fun that she's having with yeah. us, mm -hmm. and it's not the picture that pushes any edges. Mm -hmm. It's because John Waters, with a big budget now, or bigger budget, and a cast, a uh, big star cast, uh, has lost, I think, all of his edge, and I don't think it's... He's really making a very interesting picture. You know, I don't know why I didn't think of that myself, trying to imagine this picture with Divine playing the then Kathleen you... Turner role, because then you would have yes. a twist that would probably redeem this material, right. but as it is, it just isn't funny it because isn't. It, she's not funny she because knows. she basically knows what's going on. Knows well, and also is really kind of sympathetic in a way. Yeah, when, it, when it, you want to laugh at her and you can't. Yeah, John Waters ought to get back to making pictures for about a hundred thousand bucks. Okay, next movie and our next picture is White Fang Two: Myth of the White Wolf, a sequel to the enjoyable boy and his husky movie White Fang a few years ago. This time with a new older boy. And the dog, well, he looked about the same. And this movie is easy to review. I love the dog, I didn't care for the humans. Here we meet the young gold miner and his dog, which is half wolf, as they travel some rapids trying to carry the young man's gold to town. barely survives the river and is taken to an Indian camp to recover. Well, naturally, he's nursed back to health by the prettiest Indian maiden, but they have a cultural conflict. All standard stuff. 
Why would I wear that? I don't know. I thought it would look pretty. Pretty like a white girl. The bad guy pretends to be a missionary who hangs around the Indian village and torments the natives, trying to get them off their land. And also here, he's trying to get rid of the boy, too, offering him a bribe to leave, even though the kid is mistaken for an Indian god. I'm losing my patience with you, Henry. These people might think you're something special, but I know you're not. Now, I'm warning you. Don't go back up that mountain. I don't know. I would have thought White Fang 2 would have been an easy sequel to make well. Just give us more adventures in nature with the boy and the dog, or even the dog alone. We get so little of that. The story with the Indians was boring at all times. I can't even recommend White Fang 2, I think, for nature-loving kids. Well, that's exactly who I would recommend it for. I think for young kids, it's an adventure film. It's a lot of fun. It's exciting. Really? It's outdoors. It's kind of Indiana Jonesy when they fall down, fall down the shaft into that mine and get involved in the chase with the miners. And that's what the movie is intended to be. Now, I've read White Fang by Jack London. It's okay, a, I have It's too. a book about a dog, basically, and the humans have very supporting roles. They have not done that here. In yes. fact, one of my criticisms of this movie is that the dog is off screen yes. a lot of the time. Yes. But at the same time, seen for what it is, it's a, I, it, first of all, the violence is not too violent. The, the bloodshed is not very bloody. There's a it, ringing endorsement. No, no, I'm talking about this movie as exactly what it is. Let's say for grade school and junior high school kids. Oh, right. It's an exciting don't Saturday I, afternoon I, movie, and that's what it is. I, I don't think that uh, it has any of that because it doesn't... It, it, the central character, the dog, is lost in the picture, no, Roger. They, they, never, they never make the dog into the central character. The kid is the central character. He's a bore. Well, according to you, when we come back, Chevy Chase is thrilled when his house is chosen for a stakeout in Cops and Robertson. You be good cop. I'll be bad cop. You are not a cop. You're getting spooked, Jake. Jake, I'm sorry my son jumped on you and bit your neck and tried to suck your blood. It happens. Veteran cop Jack Palance is taking out a mobster who is living in the house next door when he's startled by a five-year-old kid who pretends he's a vampire. Little kid is just one of the hazards faced by the police when they commandeer Chevy Chase's home for their stakeout position in the new would-be comedy called Cops and Robertsons. The biggest problem is Chevy Chase himself, who is addicted to TV cop shows and is thrilled beyond words by the news that the cops actually want to use his home. Early in the film, he sneaks them into the house, hides them in a closet, and then tries to keep it all a secret from his wife, played here by Diane Weiss. Oh, that was the, uh, the, the cat. The cat? What's the cat doing in the closet? Who knows? Be doing anything in there, doors closed. Norman, let the cat out of the closet. I can't do that, Helen. Why not? Because I'm training her. She was a bad cat, and I'm disciplining her. Bad cat. Very bad. What's going on? Nothing. Go back to sleep. Chase is a hero worshiper who likes to play cop, and one day he borrows Jack Palance's gun to see what it would feel like to be a real detective. You talking to me? You talking to me? You talk to me? You? Me? Norman? One of the macho things Jack Palance does is roll his own cigarettes, but when Chevy Chase tries to imitate his hero, by sneaking around the gangster's house, he's cornered by mobster Robert Davi, who calls his bluff. I never learned how to roll myself. No, I learned this from a little Rastafarian friend in college. Where was he from? Huh? Uh, Rastafaria. There's not much that's funny, and certainly nothing that's original in Cops and Robertsons, and one of the most frustrating things about the movie is the intelligence level of the characters. The movie was directed by Michael Ritchie, who made one of last year's best and smartest comedies called The Positively True Adventures of the Alleged Texas Cheerleader Murdering Mom. And that was a smart comedy. This is a dumb one. It's too bad oh. when you see a director like Ritchie, yeah. who really has it in him to keep you thinking, and he, yeah. he doesn't try. Uh, there's, it's the script. It's, I didn't laugh once. No. Uh, the, the jokes are simply not funny. Chevy Chase, unfortunately... I don't know. I mean, has he worn out his welcome uh, in the entertainment world? He didn't work in the talk show. Uh, he's involved here in a script that his character isn't fun. He doesn't have any no, edge think, to him. No, 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 no. I th Chevy Chase 
could be out next month with a hit movie. Well, it's he was all good. Material. He was it's good at those material. Fletch pictures. He should know. Of course, and Michael Ritchie directed the Fletch pictures he too. Should, they should know yes. better than to try and palm this but stuff right, off. It's in the script. Now, don't don't dump on Chevy Chase. He's a funny guy in the right material, which is true of almost any comedian. This is the wrong material. It is the wrong material. Coming up next, the early days of the Beatles, focusing on the man known as the fifth Beatle, who would leave the band early to pursue an art career. Time is 1960, the place Hamburg, Germany, and a young English band is about to take the city by storm. They're the Beatles, of course, and at the beginning of the picture, they number not four, but five people, including a couple of people you don't know. The band's first drummer, Pete Best, and a bass player named Stuart Sutcliffe, John Lennon's very best friend. You are how old? Eighteen. Eighteen. Everything's cool. Everyone's 18. 18 in February. A pretty young German photographer and her boyfriend take a liking to the band and to Stuart Sutcliffe behind those dark glasses. He's played by Stephen Dorff. The other key character in the film is John Lennon, played uncannily well by Ian Hart, who has played him before on film, and Backbeat is very good at portraying John Lennon as a driven, sexually conflicted man with a marvelous sense of humor. Actress Cheryl Lee plays the photographer who would inspire the Beatles' mop-top look. Why don't I let you into a little secret between the two of us? I'm not angry, sister. I'm desperate. I think you're jealous. Jealous? Oh, yeah. Jealous, jealous of you, jealous of you. Jealous of me. If you are a Beatles fan, any scrap of information about the group is fascinating. Even this old show business movie scene of musicians being turned on to drugs. I was thinking more along the lines of a steak. <laughs> I like Backbeat. The actors are all fine, and I was fascinated by the Lennon character as well as that of Stuart Sutcliffe. The music is not played by the Beatles, but rather interpreted by members of some of today's top bands, and there has been some fudging of the facts. Needlessly so, I think, for dramatic purposes. Still, I like Backbeat, and I think that keeps my record intact of liking every single film made about the Beatles, from documentaries to docudramas like Backbeat. Even liked I Want to Hold Your Hand. I like, well, that's a wonderful okay, film. Yeah. Uh, every single one. Okay, I can't vote thumbs up on Aww. this movie, and I'll tell you why. why. I think that at the point when they were starting to make it, they should have said, what is interesting about Stuart Sutcliffe if the Beatles had never existed? I think there's that And there. then they might have had a movie. But the problem is, this is one of those movies that depends upon the fact that we all know that the Beatles went on to become famous and that Stuart okay. Sutcliffe, unfortunately, missed the boat. And th that irony is what is supposed to give meaning to so many yeah. scenes that really don't work on their own. But Roger, I thought it was interesting. He made the choice. I mean, frankly, I don't know that he had a, he had a, obviously a less uh, flamboyant life, but he wanted to be an artist. He okay, clearly now, had Would you want to see a movie about, would you want to see a movie about some kid who goes to Hamburg and paints yeah. and, and meets a girlfriend? And has an, a, a very uh, tough, involved relationship with a great, great artist. Yes, another great artist. Uh, but I not, saw it. that's not there on the screen. I saw, I saw no. it. The Beatles are there. You can't deny mm -hmm. it. And I, I enjoyed the whole thing all it, the way through. As a movie, this doesn't really I, oh, pay I, off. I think the, the performances are all there. Okay, when we come back, a film about the legendary and reclusive Glenn Gould, who was one of the world's most successful concert pianists, when one day he decided to stop appearing in public. Our next movie really created a spell for me. It's called 32 Short Films About Glenn Gould, but actually it's one film with 32, or depending on how you count, 33 short segments 
exploring various aspects of the life and personality of Glenn Gould, who was a Canadian concert pianist who withdrew from public view for the last 18 years of his life. Colm Fior plays Gould in this scene backstage at his last public concert. My uh, wife has all of your records. Well, tell your wife she has exceptional taste. Also, she's very lucky. I'm never going to sign one of these again. After he retired from the stage, Gould spent the rest of his life trying to make absolutely perfect recordings of the great piano classics. the movie is 32 short films about Glenn Gould, and I think what that means is that there could not be one single film about this man who did such a good job of hiding himself so that people had to approach him from many different angles. The experience of this film was fascinating for me. It was like a meditation on music and on why some people devote their lives to it. Oh, I think it's a wonderful project. I like this approach, frankly. I think a lot, I think other people could be studied in this fashion. Yeah. Just the way you said, rather than trying to Put yourself through the, the boilerplate of an ongoing story yes. and leaving out so much. Why not take some of the most interesting aspects of them and hit a person tangentially? Mm -hmm. We can make the connections. It's great. Yes, it's, it's, it's like you leave out all the boring stuff yeah. and you just... What they so often do with an artist is they start at A and they go to yeah. Z and they try to turn it into a biopic you got it. where it all makes sense and it all pays off. Right. And actually, what happens here is... Some of the little scenes are simply anecdotes about yes. Gould, that somebody remembers, here's what he did that day. And well, I've always what? thought about that, and yeah. I want to show you, know you how like, it worked for me. I just thought of it. This is like a wake, where people are, you're eavesdropping, and people yes. are telling stories to each other. You remember when he did this? You remember when he did that? Yes, and, and that somehow that a person so much better yes. because they're taking characteristic yeah. scenes. The other thing I, you didn't mention on why he retired, and I think the film does explain it very well, is that he also didn't like, I think he viewed art as very political, and he... Look, didn't like the superior subordinate relationship of the audience and the artist. He felt that every single person deserved to have the best seat in the yeah. house, and he felt that he could only yeah. give them that through his A record. fascinating guy and a okay. fascinating film. Coming up next, inspired by Holly Hunter's recent Oscar win for playing a mute character, our video pick of the week, which features another memorable movie character who doesn't speak. Siskel and Ebert's video pick of the week, brought to you by Orville Redenbacher, the first and last name in popcorn. When Holly Hunter won an Oscar last month for playing a mute woman in the piano, a lot of people pointed out that silent characters have often done well around the Academy Awards. And then a friend reminded me of an Oscar-nominated performance from back in 1968. And so my video pick of this week is one of my favorite little-known films from that period, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, with Alan Arkin, Oscar-nominated as a gentle, silent man who comes to the aid of many people in a small southern town including a shy young woman played in her film debut by Sandra Locke, also nominated for an Oscar. Who is it, Nick? Oh, there's somebody about the room, Mom. Hmm. Oh, uh, I see. Uh, well, we do have a room, but it's $20 a week. The Heart is a Lonely Hunter is based on a Carson McCullers novel, and the film is very good at describing in a quiet way the whole world of this town, the way that the... Alan Arkin character moves through this world like a compress, taking and removing the pain of others. It's a beautiful film recommended for moviegoers of all ages, and it's my video pick of the week. Now let's recap the movies we reviewed on this show. Two thumbs down for Serial Mom, the John Waters comedy with Kathleen Turner. The one-note satire wears thin very quickly. A split vote on White Fang 2. Roger calls it a rousing adventure story, but I enjoyed the dog more than the human characters. Two thumbs down, way down for the dismal comedy Cops and Robertsons. A split vote for the docudrama on the early years of the Beatles called Backbeat, with for me an uncanny portrait of John Lennon and his friend Stuart Sutcliffe, who would leave the band. Roger didn't think the picture justified itself except for its association with the Beatles. And finally, two thumbs up, way up, for the offbeat film, 32 short films about Glenn Gould, a docudrama of the celebrated concert pianist who gained a cult following when he chose to stop performing in concert. It's a special approach to the film biography. It certainly is, and I hope that people get a chance to see it as playing around the country in various markets. That's it for this week. 
Next week, we'll be back with Bad Girls, starring Annie McDowell, Madeline Stowe, Drew Barrymore, and Mary Stuart Masterson as four Western women who create their own posse. And Naked in New York, a romantic comedy starring Eric Stoltz and featuring Kathleen Turner, Timothy Dalton, and Whoopi Goldberg. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. St. Ives Swiss Formula Peaches and Cream Facial Beauty Wash for a peaches and cream complexion at St. Ives Swiss Formula naturally. If you'd like to save up to 50% on your contact lenses, eyeglasses, and eye exams, call for a free Lens Express catalog and find out how you can start saving right away. Hooked on Phonics teaches you to read using flashcards, music, and books. It's colorful, musical, and fun. Learn to read with Hooked on Phonics. Call 1-800-ABCDEFG. New St. Ives Swiss Formula Papaya Plus, the gentle shampoo plus conditioner and one for naturally beautiful, healthy hair. New St. Ives Swiss Formula Papaya Plus. Good and Boogie and Hot Country Hits. It's Billy Bob's Country. Next at midnight.